Um, welcome to the final lecture, everyone. This is my last lecture. Um, one thing I have to get across to you before we start is something I know you're all very, very excited for, which is the house points. And as it turns out, everyone wins. Oh, you're all winners. Oh my god. Crazy. All of you managed to get 150 million, 150,150 points. Unheard of. Can I tell you, in the whole history of teaching this course, all of the other times I've taught this course, nobody has ever gotten that many points. It's a vacuously true statement. Leave me alone. OK. All right. Let's get started, shall we? So welcome to the last lecture. Thank you all for showing up. I know it's early, but it's also the regular time that you all signed up for. So also, I'm not thanking you at all. You're supposed to be here. Um, as mentioned, this is my final lecture. So I have some things I kind of wanted to tell you about this course. I wanted to review the content with you, because I know you're all furiously studying for your final exam. Um, but I kind of wanted to uh, send off this course in the best way I know how, which is standing in front of a crowd of people and talking. Okay? Um, this is our final picture, our final splash art for, uh, for the semester. And, and the reason for this, you know, I gave you, this is actually, if anyone recognizes this, this is the same one from the first lecture, right? We're kind of returning to our roots. And the reason I picked this a long time ago is, you know, triangles, uh, it was kind of a cool geometric shape, and the colors of 150 are black and white, like this jacket I'm wearing, right? Black and white, um, binary, like kind of, kind of very down to earth and, and, and straight to the point. Um, and I picked this at first for the, final, for the final splash, but I was thinking, like, something doesn't fit. And if there's something I know, it's when something fits, when something makes sense, when there's like a cohesive reason to be doing it. And this doesn't fit. Because what have I been showing you all semester? I've been showing you that 150 is not black and white. Functional programming could be no farther from it. Because functional programming is, is varying and expressive and beautiful. And, and it's as wide and as free as the colors of a rainbow, or the colors of a parrot's rings, or the colors of a haichu. Have at it. Let's go. Have at it. Have at it. Thank you. No, 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 no. Get them when you get them, all right? Take as many as you like. Please take as many as you like, all right? So let's take the high chew route. Let's take the colorful route, what we've been doing all semester. Let's see how colorful we can be, all right? For one last time, this is my final lecture. Welcome. We're going to do it for real. This is the real finale. And what do I have for you? I've got a whole bunch of things to talk about. We're going to have to do this justice, and we're going to have to do this the only way I know how. So what do we got? on our plate for today. Well, I have a, a pathological need to do everything uniquely and to do everything in a way that is original, which means I had to make all these slides by myself to much effort. And one thing I got from, but one thing I will steal from Michael Erdman, who teaches in the spring, is this idea that to, to send off this course, what we're going to do is we're going to rewind. We'll start at the end, and let's go backwards. And eventually, let's end up going through every single lecture that we've seen thus far and recap what we've seen. Okay? This is going to be the highlights. This is going to be the takeaways, the things I want you to know about each lesson. So don't feel like you have to write it down and memorize everything. But if you've been paying attention, if you're well prepared, everything you see should be familiar. Okay? So let's rewind. It's like YouTube Rewind, except that it's not canceled, and it's also better. All right? It's been a long semester. 12 weeks have gone and soared by. I don't know about you, but I feel like I've been here for very little time. We've made it through fire alarms, made it through compiler bugs, for real, Andrew machine outages, which was a fun email to computing services. Um, and it's been tough, but we've made it through, all right? Uh, you've survived your homeworks. You've survived everything. You've survived two, having to take two midterms. But now, we're nearing the end. So let's review everything, and let's go backwards. Let's go back to the beginning. Program analysis, lecture 21. So, 
What did I want you to take away from this one? Programs are recursive. When you write a program, it's just a recursive type, a tree, something that has recursion in its structure. And that means don't be afraid of recursion. Don't treat recursion like it's some beast underneath the sink because it can be your friend. And it, as we've seen in this course, it has been your friend. And expressing something as, which has so much content as a program can be as simple as just doing data type program equals, right? Something with as much content can be just that simple. So the key thing to remember here is that when it comes to use cases, when it comes to doing things right, when it comes to making an impact, I think that program analysis is one of the final frontier use cases. I think that it has something really special to it. So the lesson I want you to take away is don't be afraid to make a real impact by using clean foundations and practical principles and principled methods like I've been teaching you all semester. We can make a real impact. You can make a real impact. Okay? See me in like two or three years. Apply. Please do. We'll take, you'll, we'll take you. All right. Lesson 20, compilers. Well, what did I want you to get away from this? Functional programming was made for compilers. This is a lie, actually. It was made for AI. But that's a different, different, that's a very different story. The same tools we use every day, the same magic that runs through the veins of our computer, is exactly the same sort of thing that you, we have seen by pure functions and tree transformations and safe code. All of these things are just correlated. But all of these simple ideas I've been teaching you all semester come to a head because they build and build and build until eventually you have one of the most complex pieces of software that we've ever created, right? One of the most essential pieces of software, the modern compiler. So don't be afraid of it. And don't be afraid to, of, of the things that you've learned. Okay? Cherish it and treasure it. Safety, elegance, expressivity. It's just these three ideas over and over again. Everything else is just commentary. So the lesson I want you to take down is you, nothing can't be understood. You can understand everything. Just break it down to little pieces. The same foundations that you find when you're writing a simple tree sum function are the same that run the SML and J compiler or the GCC compiler. Okay? Some of the most complicated systems in the world. Imperative programming, here's a fun one. Uh, we learned that functional programming doesn't need to be a binary. It doesn't need to be an absolute concept because there are shades and there are varying flavors of it. And functional programming is just a habit. It's an idea. It's a paradigm, but it's not an absolute thing. So we learned in this lecture about ref cells, right? I can have a box that contains a value of type alpha. That's an alpha ref, or some value of type T, OK? And then you know, we also learned that those boxes can contain other boxes, which is fun, okay? and allows us a layer of indirection we don't normally get. Um, we learned about these primitives that let us create, access, and modify ref cells, respectively. And we saw some pretty pictures which look like this. This is how you should think of them. They're just boxes. And by opting into these boxes, we can increase our expressivity, but not at the cost of foot guns. Okay? Mutability is a foot gun, don't get me wrong. We don't want to have it on all the time. That's the thing I told you on the first lecture. But if we opt in, if we're careful, if we're judicious, if we maintain these principles, we'll be okay. okay? So we're not beholden to ideas just because that it feels like we should be, or it's, or it's, dis or it's that kind of vibe. Right? We invented these things to make them work for us. So let's do it. Mutability is not so bad. Just have the choice. Okay? Bad things can be good if you have the choice. A lesson 18, lazy programming. All right? We learned that we can suspend computations if I have a thunk. If I have something like this, fn unit goes to e, I have a suspension of e where e is never evaluated. Eager evaluation because I freeze the contents of a lambda. I can't evaluate this until I get the unit. Very, very simple idea. Very, very simple. This is something that you could have learned from the fifth lecture onwards, or the, well, 10th lecture onwards. Okay, actually earlier, I don't care. Anyways, um, we have fine grained control. We can have control over when computations happen. But it all comes out of this idea of treating lambdas as values and simply being able to put things in lambdas. And we saw the alpha stream data type, which looks like this, which means that I can have a stream which is a delayed front and a front which is an exposed stream. And we saw that by writing mutually recursive functions, we could write infinite data structures. Finite, infinite, it doesn't matter because I can write things like this. I can define the natural numbers via just saying a simple function that has no base case, because I delay the rest of it. This is a very different style of programming than you may have seen in other contexts. But it's very, very cool. And it's co-inductive is the word for it. Okay? You can learn more about this if you take 15.3.12. Um, but this is a very powerful idea. And having that control, having the option to control when computations happen, that's something powerful. So 
Lesson here, repeated application of simple ideas can lead to something great. We don't need to have fancy constructs. We don't need to have fancy, fancy stuff. All we need are lambdas and an idea. Lesson 17, sequences. Uh, sequences, remember, we have things that are basically lists, but they're for bulk operations on data. Uh, we represent them by this mathematical notation, and we think of them as immutable arrays. As much as you, you think of them as arrays in the same sense as you think of the guy in the mascot at the, at the football game as a human inside the suit. Like, you, you don't know for sure, but like, it probably is, okay? Um, same deal, right? They offer the same operations as lists, but different use cases. Because if you're doing sequential stuff, you shouldn't be using them, probably, because cons is expensive. But that's okay. And with, by using a very simple mathematical idea, right, associativity, we can do things like reduce in a lot faster time, log n, rather than folding in O of n, which is really, really powerful, by the way, because log n is practically constant. Okay? So just by adopting this divide and conquer approach, this simple recursive idea, we can do all the things we ever wanted to do on sequences. Um, we also have this idea of cost graphs, remember, which are how we diagnose and how we ascertain the cost of functions. Um, by using this, we can recover the cost of any higher order function by simply taking these cost graphs and jamming them together. Okay? So for instance, we have the cost graph for tabulate, which just says do all these guys in parallel. And then if I wanted to do this seek.tabulate f and i goes to f of seek.nth si, I first have to pay the cost for length, um, uh, and then I'm going to pay the cost for the nth call, and then the cost for f. Right? But all I'm doing is I'm taking these individual cost graphs, and I'm jamming them together. You can understand anything. Just break it down into simple, usually recursive parts. So lesson here is, uh, well, lesson here is functional programs are parallel friendly. The cooks in the kitchen don't get in each other's way. And then you never end up with a plate of marinara sauce on your plate. Okay? Easy, composable bulk operations. That's what parallelism is about. Now, all right, lecture 16, we're on red black trees. So we learned about red black trees, which are a self-balancing binary tree. With these three invariants, uh, the most important ones being that the black height on any path is the same, and that every child of a red node must be black. All right? But by employing a strategy where we first break and then restore the invariance, we make sure that we never, we, first of all, we, we cleanly get to implement this insertion operation, and we always make sure that our invariants are respected. Break it, and then fix it by pushing our red nodes upwards. It's a very elegant idea. Okay? And we saw by employing these kinds of rotations where I take these red nodes and I push the red node up, we end up being able to continuously rebalance on our way up, which is going to give us that nice insertion operation where we preserve our invariance. But the real thing to realize here is that abstract types, the things we learned about in the modules lecture, allow us to get safer code because you can think past the interface. I don't need to think about the little inconsistencies. I can think via invariance. So when we program, Program with invariance. Go with God. Okay, lessons 15, functors. Um, functors are maps from modules to modules. I can have a module that takes in a module and gives me out another module. It's really no different than a higher order function, um, but what, or a, really a function. Uh, but what we can do is we can have this idea of type classes, which are signatures, ways of specifying particular pieces of software. And what we can do is we can attach values to types. I can have the int type with an attached comparison function, like this int ord. But this lets us modularize our code. We can write code predicated on other pieces of code in a more extensible way than just simple higher order functions. And the fact that this works at all, that the, this is theoretical stuff, like is possible, is only due to decades of research on the part of PL researchers. Okay? So this is like pretty impressive, even if it's easy to take for granted. Um, and what we saw is that this primarily led us to find a polymorphic dictionary. We could define a dictionary where our key is now parameterized over any type class, so that this key is anything, any type, and any value that ascribed to ORD for some type. And then I can define my dictionary just as that. That's all you need. Good software should be composable in terms of other software. If it's not, you're going to rewrite the same thing over and over again, and it's going to look like my LaTeX slides. Okay? It's not going to look good. I mean, like the source. Like it really is truly something awful. I, I thought about whether or not I was going to make it open source, and then I was like, wait, no. Um, OK. 14, structures and signatures, or modules. This is where we first learned about software, putting stuff together. Uh, modules which let us organize and separate code into namespaces. Because we might want stuff that are pertain to lists to live over here, and stuff that pertain to ints to live over here, and everything else can go wherever. So, we also use signatures, which are the types of modules. I want you to see this analogy where we have types corresponding to signatures and we have modules corresponding to values, right? 
and functors and functions over here. All right? I literally drew, drew that chart for you at one point. Uh, for instance, we might have a signature for int sets. But the real thing that modules give us is this information hiding stuff. When I look at this signature, that is all I know about this piece of software. That is all I need to know about this piece of software. I don't care if it's a tree. I don't care if it's a list. I don't care if it's Barney in a costume. I care that this is a type of sets and that I can have an empty set. I can insert, remove, and then check for membership. That's all I know. That's all I care about. So separate yourself into two people. Did anyone know? Wait. Oh, man, this is going to be a really bad reference. Did anyone watch Jackie Chan Adventures? OK, cool, cool, cool. You know the thing where he has like, the amulets and like, they give, you, give him powers? Oh. There's like a there's like a tiger there's like a tiger talisman that like separates you into your like two different selves like good or good and bad I think in this case uh, tiger talisman yourself you are both the implementer and the implementee and the implementer knows everything and you as the implementee know nothing all right tiger talisman yourself you are oblivious you know nothing about the internals because it'll make you a more effective programmer for it I really didn't think that many of you would would jump at that wow that's crazy I just thought of that right now okay. Um, but this gives us a lot of power when making software composable and conceptually simple. So separate your interfaces cleanly. That's what you should take away. Regular expressions. Well, uh, regular expressions are a recursive data type that do a certain thing, right? Uh, and they let us define languages that we're interested in matching. And this is very, very useful, OK? Like, this is a very practical skill to have. Uh, and we saw that we could simply define the languages matched by a regular expression in terms of this simple regex over here, uh, which I'm not going to go through one by one. But this kind of simple mathematical definition crops up everywhere. Crops up in our code, and it will crop up in our code because we wrote a matcher that recursively decomposes on that same definition to be able to match something. But the kind of thing I wanted you to get away from this is this proof by picture. This picture. If you know nothing else about regexes going into the final, be able to draw this picture. Because if I give you a problem on regexes, by the way, it's probably testing your ability to understand conceptually what this picture means. That was the point of the two regex questions I gave on midterm two. Midterm two, one, and then midterm two, two. OK? Um, so this picture, be able to draw it, be able to understand why it does what it does. Prefix matched by R. Suffix satisfied by K. That's it. Reasoning by specification is more powerful than reasoning via stepping through code. Reasoning by picture is better. Exceptions. Well, we saw exceptions, and honestly, I, I think you all got, like, I wasn't super into it. Like, exceptions are whatever. But, uh, you know, the point is that it's an extensible type. We can add constructors to it. It's helpful. Um, and then we can use it as escape, hand, uh, as escape hatches. If something goes wrong, if you're in the middle of your code, and then something, you reach something you didn't want to deal with, well, raise, fail, to do. And therefore, you've now, you're now a software engineer. Good job. Um, exception handling style looks like CPS. But what we can do is instead of having an explicit failure continuation, I can raise not found and handle it at my recursive call. That's all I need to do. It's OK to take less maintainable shortcuts. Just be careful. Be judicious. OK, the, po the point where you start getting into, oh, maybe it's OK, uh, try not to get there if at all possible. OK, I don't want to be responsible for, for an exception being raised and then someone being mad at me for it. Okay. Continuation passing style, and now we're truly back in the weeds. This is at the halfway point in the course. CPS is hard. <laughs> I know you all know CPS is hard. But it's not so hard if you can take the right approach to thinking about it. We've got the tree sum function here. And what I want you to realize is this is literally just an algorithm. The whole point of CPS is, you know, if, if the idea of direct recursion is do it, the idea of CPS is do it in a continuation. Just do the operation you would have done with the recursive call, but in a continuation. So if I start with tree sum, first I replace my recursive calls with placeholder variables. Then I add in calls to my recursive function that pipe into lambdas that bind it to that. Does everybody see why this third one should be essentially equivalent to this first one? Thumbs up, thumbs down, give me a temperature check on that. More people, come on. Okay. When we pipe into this function here, we right, we just get to we get to bind tree sum of L to res R, and it ends up just evaluating to this. So if you're able to think with this piping idea, why did I pipe it like this at all, right? Well, it turns out we're going to be able to use this analogy to make it look simple and make it look similar to real CPS. Because the next thing we do is we say, 
instead of piping into this continuation, what if I give the continuation to the argument? I make it something called a cool function. So I kill the pipe, I add this k function, and then I pipe into k when I return my result. The handshake, I have to maintain my pact, which is that I pass my recursive result into k. Okay? Complicated things can be made simple. You just need an algorithm for it. Okay? You have a procedural way to solve. And then any dummy can do it. A machine can do it. All right? Combinators and staging. Well, OK. Uh, this one we talked about staging, which is this idea that if I do foo x, y, which is curried, and I have a horrible computation on x. And remember, this horrible computation takes three years. It takes a long time. OK? I could write it like this instead, where instead of accepting the curried argument y and immediately calling horrible computation, first I call the horrible computation. And then I return a lambda that takes y. Why am I doing this? Well, it means if I partially apply foo, as, that is, if I do something like val f equals foo of 2, this takes two years, uh, three years to run. But every subsequent call to f takes constant time. Okay? Versus if I did foo of 3, 2, foo of 2, 1, which does take a while. Okay? We can be smart about where we put our work. We just need to be able to have simple concepts like currying. And then we also learned about pipe, which is you know, my favorite. I love pipe. Okay, Maybe some of you don't love pipe. Well, let me take a, let me take a, let me take a, a straw poll. Who likes pipe? Raise your hand. OK. All right, all right. We're, we're aware of that one. It's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not our fault. OK, blame the people who came before us. Um, <laughs> um, anyways. We have this very nested call where I heat the oven to 400, I insert the tray of mozzarella sticks, I wait two, and I remove. And look at how many parens I used. That's too many parens. I can't have that many parens. But what do I do? I use my pipe instead. And I pipe into each, and now it reads like a, like a sequence of operations, like a cookbook. What's the lesson here? Pretty privilege is OK, but only for code. Okay. All right. Lesson nine, we're on the double, uh, single digits now. Higher order functions, which is my favorite lecture in the whole course. We learned about currying, which is just a function that takes in multiple arguments by returning functions that take in the additional arguments. Right? We're familiar with that by now. We've seen a lot of examples. So for instance, if I had add of x comma y goes to x plus y, int start int to int. It takes in a tuple of two ints. It takes both ints at once. But add c, the curried form of add, is a lambda that returns a lambda that returns nothing, because I forgot to put x plus y here. But if x plus y were here, it would be correct. All right? And we can have syntactic sugar to declare it as well, because I just do this thing where I space separate the arguments. Okay? Currying is very, very useful. It's way more useful than having tuples a lot of the time, because it gives us this idea of partial application as well. Okay. Um, and we also saw that hops are really important, because it lets us factor out common patterns in our code. If I have functions like sum and concat, you know, sum where sum sums everything in the list, and concat concatenates all of the strings. You know, syntax versus semantics, when I look at this code, I see the same thing. I see the same function. And maybe you're starting to see it too. Because when you look at this code, I see a fold. And it turns out that when all of this code exhibits the same pattern, the really great thing about functional programming is that we can isolate those patterns, and we can compose them, and we can define every function ever via a few simple primitive higher order functions. Higher order functions, writing code, oops, uh, they're an essential tool in functional programming, blah, blah, blah. It opened the door to a lot of other things. Like We wouldn't be able to do match. We wouldn't be able to do CPS. We wouldn't be able to do lazy without this idea of being able to have lambdas as values, functions as values. It all comes down to one simple idea. What if functions were values? It opens the door to so many other things. Writing code is good. Writing code that writes code is better. I'm not talking about LLMs here. All right, polymorphism. She's over there. So before we could learn about Hoffs, we needed a way to generalize the types of our functions. And this is very, very important. Functions of potentially arbitrary type. How do we do it? Well, we found out that we could instantiate our functions with just simple type variables. We could assign a variable to each type by saying that if I had fun, fxy equals if x, then y, else 2. We collect constraints on each of the variables. We start with a simple polymorphic type variable for each. So x starts as alpha, y starts as beta. But what do I do? 
I see that we do an if on x. Therefore, what is it? Should be a bool. I see that we return y. I can't really say much about this here. I just leave it be. But also, this type needs to be the same as this type, right? Therefore, y should be an int. And then the return type of my function is the same as y, or 2, which is an int. So I end up with bool to int to int. Simple procedural rules are all we need to solve these kinds of things. But having that extra flexibility in our types makes all the difference. But, uh, so yeah, uh, most general types. And we saw this kind of idea where we have a most general type, where all of the types I could have, um, you know, my least common ancestor is going to be the, the most general type for my function, okay? the, the thing that joins all of them together. On this, on this sort of type tree, all you need to be able to visualize. So we get concrete benefits in our code just by adjusting type structure a bit. It only takes a little bit to take us very far. That's a, con a common idea here, right? We only need to make our types a little bit more powerful, and we get the world for it. Again, take 15.3.12 for more on this. Sorting and parallelism. Well, we're back, back into the math here. Um, at this point, we were more concerned with math and the formal parts of analyzing code. We've always kind of had it, but I've been, less pre I've been more preoccupied with other things in the past month or so. Um, but we learned about the tree method. And the tree method lets us solve recurrences that have this form where it's like w of n equals da da da. And somewhere in there, there's a 2w of n something, like n over 2, n minus 2. I don't know. I don't care. OK? Some quantity in here. But the tree method lets us solve recurrences of this form because we sum up the work per level of the tree induced by this, these calls. So uh, for instance, if I had uh, inord, oh no, actually, sorry. I just have a general recurrence where w of n expands to w of n over 2, sorry. Um, it looks like this. The call tree looks like this. So what if I just sum up the non-recursive work at each level of the tree? Then I'm going to get my answer, right, my closed form. So for inord, this specific recurrence, I might do this, where I have red being my recursive calls and purple being my non-recursive work. But we saw it induces this kind of tree structure, right? Where my size is dividing by two each time, but each time I also divide my work by two. So on the whole, I end up with c sub two times n over two. Uh, yeah, yeah, multiply, yeah, yeah. C sub two times n over two per level, right? Very, very simple. All you need to do is be able to sum up per, per level. Simple mathematical tricks. I taught you some ones, uh, some nice mathematical mnemonics. Remember those. There's a question? OK, cool. Um, all right. And we learned about span. If we have infinitely many processors, uh, it doesn't solve all our problems because we have intrinsic data dependencies. But it's important to think about how your code would run in a parallel situation. Because sometimes we're interested in brute forcing traveling salesmen, OK? Um, uh, which, by the way, is a stupid idea. But um, uh, sometimes you're taking 15, 418, uh, and it's your homework assignment. So we're interested in being able to have this idea of span, a parallel cost. And if you take 15 to 10, they will tell you more. Um, but we saw this in the use case for merge sort, where we can get an O of n span. I don't know why I wrote log n there, uh, which is a very simple implementation, which you can look at and remember the good times for like five seconds, but I'm not going to go through it. OK, remember the good times. Um, but this is probably one of my favorite pieces of code in this entire course, because I think this is one of the first times you can really see SML code and be like, wow, that's nice. That's beautiful. That's very, very elegant. I don't want to chase pointers. I don't want to deal with it. Let's just go ahead. Uh, complicated things can be simple. Just do them recursively, and recursive mathematical analysis will be easy too. Uh, we're almost at the beginning, end, beginning. Um, before we could talk about parallel complex complexity, though, we had to talk about generally doing runtime. Uh, so we did that. Remember, you didn't even know what a recurrence was by this point. But we could derive a recurrence for our abstract units of cost by just denoting some kind of constant cost for certain operations and then solving a recurrence, a recursive formula. Uh, so for instance, we got a base case for our tree sum, which comes out of our base case in this code. And we got a recursive case out of our recursive code as well. right? And we have to define some notion of size. If it's a tree, could be the number of nodes, could be the depth. And either are fair game for you to be asked. Okay? Um, if it's a list, usually it's the length of the list. If it's on numbers, usually it's the magnitude of the number. But that size metric is important. And we can just solve it out um, uh, in terms of n sub l and n sub r, which differ based on the, whether or not the tree is balanced or not. Trust math. If you just use math, things can be, things can be very, very easy to understand. 
Trees. Very, very nice software trees. Um, we learned about trees, which are one instance of data type declarations, right? Uh, we've looked at a few of this course. We've looked at the compiler optimization one, which was like a program. We've looked at regular expressions. We've looked at um, ones that have, what is it? Ones that have corn and potatoes and, and all sorts of food, OK? Uh, we've looked at these data type declarations. And it might seem silly and contrived when we design them to fit these very particular scenarios. But the strength is that they can fit those scenarios at all. Okay? Structural induction can be carried out on any recursive type. Things that might not look like lists, might not look like numbers. Because induction is a general principle. And recursive data types are more broad than numbers. Okay? Previously, when you learned about induction in concepts or high school math or whatever, um, uh, that idea was a narrow one. But we can expand this to something that's way more broad, way more elegant. Um, and then what I wanted to say about that was uh, the proof follows the code. When you're writing a proof in this course, look at the code. The code and the lemmas and the various definitions thereof are all you know. When you don't know what to do next, refer back to the code, because it will tell you what to do next. Okay? And when you write your proof, the proof reasons the same way that you reason about the code being correct. Okay? Just follow the code. That's all you need. So for instance, um, if we're doing it on a tree, you get two induction hypotheses. Writing code is like writing a proof. I've said this to some of you in office hours, but like, some people might be, might be like, why are we writing proofs that are really stupid? Why are we proving tree sum is correct? Tree sum is very obviously correct, right? And that's, that's right, but it's like a muscle. You have to train it, because if you don't have that ability, you get it eventually by doing this enough times. I never write a, a proof of correctness or totality on paper, OK? But I do it in my head. When I'm writing the function for the first time, I'm doing the proof in my head as I think. I make the recursive leap of faith, and I think about my induction hypotheses. And either I come up with, oh, that feels right, or that feels wrong. And more times than you would think, this ends up with me being like, oh, I know why it's wrong. It's because of blah, blah, blah. Okay? Train that muscle. Be able to write proofs by writing code. And I'll say, like, an impoverished view of programming fits problems to certain types. But as functional programmers, we fit our types to the problems. We have that privilege. Some people don't. Okay? Structural induction, well, I kind of ledged to this already, but it's an upgrade of induction, right? At this point, we, we saw, thought that induction was just on the natural numbers. But we can induct on lists, and we can induct on trees. n and n plus 1 are really not so different than x's and x cons x's. Think about it that way. By analogy, right? And I introduced this idea of parse don't validate. And I think I mentioned I was going to link the blog post, and I'm not sure I ever did. It's probably in the original slide. But express information through types when possible. No one wants to see code looks like this. Look at this. Remember when I showed this to you? You can check when the list is empty, or n is 0, or you get the head and the tail, and then you do a bunch of crap. No. Use pattern matching. Look at the data for what it is. Because we have that privilege. We don't have to use these silly accessors all over the place that cost us time, cost us space, and cost us space in our brains. Because I don't want to think about all this random nonsense that's happening. Write it simply, write it cleanly. Okay? And also, this is where we started learning about totality and proofs. Uh, totality is a tool. It'll show up again. Sorry. Uh, but, <laughs> but if you didn't get totality, all it desugars to is this idea. We use totality to get at the valuability of certain expressions which let us use theorems or definitions or lemmas that rely on e being valuable. Okay? Totality doesn't matter. Valuability is who we care about. Okay? There's an immoral analogy I can make here. Um, parse, don't validate. Express your data through types. Types are your best friend. There is no analogy. Shh. All right. Induction and recursion. Uh, so this one we talked about. Before we could talk about structural induction, we had to talk about normal, boring induction. but we also talked about this idea of recursion. We saw that also induction on the natural numbers is really just structural induction on this data type, right? That's all it is. So structural induction is strictly more powerful and strictly more interesting. So stick with it, OK? Base case, induction hypothesis, inductive step, repeat. You all have done this many, many times. I know you've got it down pat. So just stick to that, and you'll be OK. All right. Uh, and we learned about the recursive leap of faith, all right? If you write a recursive function, assume that it already works. And then just so happens that, by God, it'll happen working. It'll happen to work. All right? Things will work out the way that it should. All right? I don't believe in destiny. I do believe in recursion. So we call, and, and I want to say again, like this idea, which is that, like, this idea of solving infinitely many problems in a finite amount of space. We have a word for that. It's called induction or recursion. It means the same thing. So 
Don't, don't expend the energy in your brain to think of all these things that are completely unrelated. No, don't step through the code. Do the recursive leap, all right? Jump off the cliff like a lemming, all right? It'll do you good. Um, and then lesson two, that's a myth, by the way. Lemmings don't actually die. They just, I don't even, I'm not even sure they jump off the cliffs. It's folklore. Um, lesson two, uh, at this point, we didn't know anything, all right? You all didn't know anything about the content of this course, but you had this idea that I tried to develop. Um, which is that, at this point, we were still getting the basics of SML, right? Uh, we were talking about extensional equivalence, which has come into play so many times throughout this course. And I cannot get across to you how important it is to be able to talk about code being equivalent. Sometimes I'll be writing code, and I'll, like, just, I'll, be, like, I'll be refactoring code, and I'll be like, wait, this is so simple. I can just move this here, because I know that it doesn't have side effects, and it won't do anything, and it's OK. And then I'll message my, my teammate. I'll be like, I am so glad. For, for equivalence, for code equivalence. Because if I didn't, I'd have to like, untangle this cat's cradle of pointers and, and nonsense, and it would be terrible. Okay? I am not paid to, to untangle strings. So we introduced this idea of binding, which is different than assignment. Because a value of a variable never changes when you bind it. When I say something like, oh, wow, I didn't, forgot that this board had stuff on it. Um, when I say something like val x equals 2, and I say something like val x equals 3. I am not mutating the value, of uh, the value of x. I am introducing an unrelated x that is bound to 3. Same name, different people. That's all that's happening. But this very simple idea is just the idea of immutability. Make sure that your variables don't change. And then guess what? You don't have to deal with foot guns. You don't have to deal with knowing the entire history of your program up until a, sp a specific point to be able to understand what it does. That's a foot gun if I ever heard one. Okay. Bindings on assignment. We can get many benefits from just thinking about immutability, this idea. And it shows up in like all sorts of languages. Okay? Pick, your, pick your favorite, except for C. All right. Okay. Back to the beginning. We're here at the prologue. This is where we started. And we started with a lot of things. One thing I wanted to talk to you about is, in the first lecture, uh, I introduced to you type disciplines. I introduced to you standard ML. And I made some promises to you. I am not a liar. I am not a liar by choice, OK? I'm not saying I'm lying to you now. But I'm, uh, I made a few promises. I want to make sure that you feel like I've, I've kept up with them, OK? So let's talk about those promises. First, one of the things I talked about was these three theses, which I've been going back to periodically through this course. Let's talk about them now that we know what we know, now that we have all the information we have. I also made this claim to you. Functional programming is nothing more than an improvement on our ability to program. It's a refinement on our ability to communicate because programming is just communication. So think of me as your relationship coach for programming. Okay? We can communicate better. We can do all this stuff. So how have we kept up these promises? How did I deliver on my foreshadowings, my, my musings, okay? my previews, as much as I love them? Course themes. This is going to be our second and middle section. Um, and we're back to the default color scheme. Okay. On the first day, I pose this question to you. What is programming? What is good programming? What should good programming be? Does anyone remember what those three things were? There were three of them. Does anyone remember? And if not, that's OK. I'm just curious, to be honest. And I will use this awkward silence to drink water. Yeah. Readable wasn't one of them, but it mattered. It was a, a secondary idea. OK, let's go with it. None of you know. That's fine. Programming should be descriptive, modular, maintainable. Let's not have go-to's. Let's not, I'll talk about it, okay? Programming should be descriptive. I gave you this idea of go-to's, okay? Which is the, 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 uh, this completely unreadable, undescriptive code that's nonsense. What the hell am I looking at when I look at literal spaghetti code with pointers that go all around? Nonsense, okay? We've seen many examples of descriptive code. We've seen specifications, formal mathematical specifications for what our code should do. We've seen pictures of what our code should do. That's descriptive. We've seen interfaces that describe parts of our code, which describe the behavior. Because what is a type other than a description? A description of what a program might do. Okay? Uh, so giving our code these invariants can help us to write descriptive code. And things like algebraic data types, parametric polymorphisms, HOFs, make us able to express so many different problems in programming. We don't have to deal with silly you know, coding hacks, uh, like function pointers, to get, at, to get at what is ultimately just these things. Okay? 
You know that meme which is like, look what they must do to approximate a fraction of our power. Like that's literally what function pointers are in comparison to closures. Okay? So we can describe more problems, but we just need the right tools. And this, in this course, I've shown you the right tools. Programming should be modular. Well, uh, you probably guess I'm going to talk to you about literal modules, okay? Which are software components that we can mix and match and look at via their interfaces. Only their interfaces. Tiger Talisman yourself, you are the implementee, right? Yes, you're the implementee, okay? You don't know what's going on inside. And that's good for it. You are more powerful because you did that. So for insets, the in, in the internal implementation, I don't care. I don't care. Just hide it via opaque description. And that makes our code modular. Because when I refactor an opaquely ascribed module, literally nothing else in my program has to change. I just change this one local part. No, I don't usually, it would be very, very hard to suddenly introduce like some kind of exceptional behavior, um, unless you did it wrong, okay? So do it right as well. And having this emphasis on types leads to modular code as well. If I have an expression and a value, I have a very specific type for it. Maybe it's an instance of a greater type, but it's very specific usually. Uh, and then maintainability. All right. This has been a course on programming better. And this has been a course on proto people that probably want to go out and write software, for most of you at least. Okay? Um, if you don't write maintainable code, the people who write code with you will hate you. And you will hate yourself. Do not hate yourself. This is a, this is a motivational talk. Write maintainable code. Having this idea of extensional equivalence, or as I call it, the refactoring lemma, means we can swap equals for equals, which is a superpower, by God. Being able to do this is the most powerful thing. But if you can't do it, you're screwed. Okay. Um, so also having types is helpful for maintainable code. Because if I am refactoring my code, and I have an int, and I accidentally make it an int tree, I'm not going to get to run my code without knowing. The compiler will probably yell at me. Okay. There are cases where you could do this, but like it, it's not in real code. Okay. Python will let you run the code anyways. Okay. Don't do that. Don't do that to yourself. All right. Functional code is not just like nice to look at, but if you have terse, understandable code, which I posit to you we've seen thus far, it will lead to more maintainability. Okay? You have to understand code before you can maintain it. Okay? I see this every day at work. All right? We look at our nice OCaml code base, which we're so proud of, and we look at other things like open source repos, and I'm like, well, guess I'm not looking at this today. So. What about the three theses? Well, OK, do they, does anyone remember these ones? These ones actually cropped up after the first lecture, so I expect some of you might know. What are the three theses? Does anyone have a guess? Give me a haichu. Give me a haichu. <laughs> Give me a haichu. Give me a haichu. Give me a haichu. No, 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 no. No, no, no. All right, all right, thank you. All right. Not quite, not quite, not quite. I was going to give you a haichu, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of them. I'm going to throw this anyways. Damn. All right, cool. Yeah. yeah. Types guide structure and then programmatic thinking is mathematical thinking. Oh, you skip straight to the, you skip straight to the, okay. You skip straight to the <laughs> second and third. That is true. Um, giving out high choose feels a little more uh, unhelpful when they're literally on the floor everywhere. But, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll give you a little floor high choose anyways. There we go. Let's go. Okay. Recursive problems, recursive solutions means don't let recursion be the bogeyman. Don't let it be the gremlin hiding underneath the bed. You don't need to be afraid of it. Okay? You know, I, I like to think like someone, some, you have an imperative programmer, and you go up to them and you say recursion, and they go, ah, right? Don't be that. All right? We've dealt with recursion literally the whole semester. We're pros. You're pros. So don't be afraid of it. Recursion is something that isn't meant to be feared. It's meant to be used. It's a tool. Make it work for you. I'm not saying shove it everywhere. But it comes up in more places than you might think. Comes up in a lot of places. Okay. If you think with specifications and you think with invariants, recursion is second nature. Program with the code, not against it. Okay. Um, and then tree-like structures and linked lists and stuff like that. They're very naturally recursive, which is a great thing. Okay. Um, programmatic thinking is mathematical thinking. I said this thing to you on the first day. Uh, computer scientists were mathematicians first. All right. So. Harness your inner mathematician. Okay? Before you can write any code, you have to be assured that it works. You have to be assured that you can problem solve. Oh boy, math happens to be about problem solving. Who would have guessed? So work and span, induction, extensional equivalence, formal specifications. All of these things let you think about code in a more mathematical way. So do it, understand problems better, and solve problems better. 
And types guide structure, I argue, actually, this one probably is the most important one from this entire semester. Let types dictate your thoughts. Close your eyes and see Tycon mismatch when you sleep, OK? Like, these, the types are the foundation, the blueprints that software is built upon. You cannot build a house without building up the structure of the house first, OK? So all these things are codified via types. The construction, destruction, interplay of data, all these things are just types at the end of the day. So currying, Hoffs, CPS, laziness, polymorphism, all of these are just things that come out of being like, what if we had XYZ little widget in our types? And then running with it. And our code is all the better for it. Okay? But just let types guide the structure. Let types be your spirit animal. I don't know what I'm saying. All right. And in addition to those, I have a couple sayings uh, that I kind of just thought came up. Uh, I planned out the three theses before we began the course. But I began, began to realize that these four things uh, kept coming up over and over again. Um, so these ones that we kind of discovered. Um, I don't think I never necessarily said this one out loud, but be clever by being dumb. And the idea of, the, of it is simply this. I feel like functional programming gets a bad rap because people are like, oh, these people are so smart and they're so you know, theoretical and they're like professors, blah, blah, blah. And some people think, you know, at work maybe even think, like, oh, he's like, he likes functional programming because he's smart. He likes types because he's smart. I like types because I'm really freaking dumb. Because if I didn't have types to guide me as my safety net, I would make like 90% of my code would be garbage. Okay? I don't like functional programming because it's clever or because it's, it's cool. I like it because it's reliable and because it gets the job done in an understandable way. Okay? So the type checker, on the first day I said, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's your worst enemy at the beginning. And now it's your best friend. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands for that one. I feel like I'm not sure if I would like the answer. But I am squarely in the best friends camp because the type checker saves me from making stupid mistakes. That's all I need. Um, learning to program, like when you're, when you're a student, like you are right now, you're learning all sorts of stuff. You're learning about malloc, and you're learning about CPS, and you're learning about, I don't know, quantum computation. Uh, and it's all cool, and it's all great. Um, but the thing you have to realize like, is that that's for school, and that's great. And I don't want to take that away from you. But also, like, learning how to program well has entailed, for me, learning how to suppress that urge of, oh, this is so clever. Oh, this is so cool. Oh, my god. Because guess what? Clever is not. Clever is not maintainable. Nobody wants to read your clever code. That, has anyone seen that like, quake thing where they approximate the inverse square root by like, ending with like, some terrible, like, like, by, like, literally it looks like this or something, and they have this like, eldritch magic number, okay, and then they like, do some bitwise operations on this, and then that's the inverse square root? I don't care about your clever code. Give me readable code. When I would work with Hugh, I'd be like, oh, that's so cool. I hate you. Okay? That's exactly what, I would, what would come out of my, my mouth. All right? Write code that speaks for itself. Write code that's simple and expressible, and it gets the job done. Because then you will get the job done. And then they'll like, throw you gold coins or something. That's how jobs in the real world work. Okay? Self-defense against yourself. I said this one a few times. This has been a class on learning how to program well. I know you know how to program. But I hope that now you feel like you've no learned how to program better. Okay? Um, learn how to live with yourself as a programmer, and as a human too, I hope. But we're often our own worst enemies when we program, because we write something, and we come back to it later, and we're like, who the fuck wrote this? Like, this is nonsense. And then we're like, oh, committer was Brandon Wu seven days ago. And you're like, oh, well, that sucks. Right? Don't leave book guns in your code. Don't, leave, don't push off work to the future. Make stuff as easy as possible for you and for people you work with. And this is the first step to learn how to program well. Defend yourself against yourself. Self-defense. OK. Um, okay. Um, and then I also said this a couple times. We are in the business of writing not code, but correct code. If you write non-correct code, you haven't written anything. You haven't gotten anywhere. You've just like jogged in place for like 20 minutes. OK. You're, you're trying to get all the way over there, but you're, you're, you're missing out on the marathon. Um, some people are in the business of writing code. They're just there to produce volumes of code. OK. I don't want to have anything to do with that, but if you want to do something, if you want to like really write stuff that, that matters or like or that people would like, okay, let's say, um, write correct code. It's in your best interest. Okay, so reasoning about specifications, type safety, essential equivalents, all of these things have just been extra steps towards making less mistakes, which is really a thesis of the course. Make less mistakes, and then finally do it, but do it better, or we can do it better, right? First day I told you this, we're here because you know how to program. 
but you need to be whipped into shape, okay? You need to, you, this, is the, this is the training scene for Mulan, all right? We're tranquil as a forest, but we gotta, we gotta burn with fire or whatever, okay? Um, the point is, <laughs> the point is, self-improvement, first you have to be open to improvement, all right? So we break you down into your constituent atoms, and we stitch you up together um, uh, throughout this course, through CPS, through DPLL, through all these assignments, all right? So that we can improve our ability to program. That's all we want. Knowing how to do something is cool, but knowing how to be really good at something, that's cool as well. So uh, for instance, concurrent use cases. Instead of rewriting functions over and over, let's use hops. Instead of running into errors at runtime, let's catch those errors statically. Let's have compiler, let's have compiler warnings. And instead of using redundant representation, use algebraic data types that fit your problem exactly, like a glove. We have the power. The power is in your hands. It's just up to what you do with it. This is, um, uh, this is not meant to be a romantic advice, but it could be. Okay, there's always better. All right. I don't, know, I don't know if this is what you thought whenever I say you can do better in this course, but that's what I've been thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing. All right. Before I go, I wanted to give you a parting note on tribalism. And this is actually maybe one of the most important things I can tell you. Um, it's not, actually. I go back and forth on this, but uh, what does it say on the back of my jacket? It says, functions are values, which is... The motto of our course, you know, functions are first class values. That's an important idea. It's a good idea. Don't get me wrong. And I'm sure you know that, you know, over there in uh, the other side of the pond, we have our nice little pals from, you know, I don't even know, should, can I even? We have our nice little pals here who believe that functions are pointers. And I don't need to tell you that this is a point of contention, right? So <laughs> my parting gift to you is that functions are. As in, no one cares, okay? I think functions are values. I think it's very important that you've learned to learn this way. I think it's very, very important to drill this into you. But it's not okay to, to language bash on people for it. It's not okay to split the world into two tribal camps and then say these guys are good and these guys are bad. And I've, when I've done so in this course, it's usually for comedic effect. Um, but it doesn't matter because these things are contextual. Functional programming, I love it. But it's good for certain things, problems I'm interested in. It's less good for other things, OK? So this is a note on empathy. Have some empathy. It's not OK to language bash. It's not OK to judge someone based on what they, what they do for their paradigm. It's OK to, to want to educate someone, to want to teach someone. But don't try to make that judgment. And I, I, I wanted to say this to you because I see this all the time. Okay? It's a very CMU thing of, oh, you're, you're, you're doing that, and you're doing that. Who cares, all right? To be, to be, say, to be, to be, like, you know, totally fair, this is a school and you're like children, but like, it, I, I do want to, I do want to let you know that, right? I do want to, I want to get this across to you, right? I do want to tell you this, okay? SML is a tool, okay? There are use cases. There are really good use cases. And it's very, very important that I taught this to you. But don't be a jerk about it, okay? Have some empathy. That's all I wanted to get across. It's not a well-defined thing. It's not worth wasting your energy meaning like they are the in-group. And, and we are the outgroup. We know better. No. The world could stand to be a bit more functional, I agree. But it's a spectrum. Okay? It's never a binary. Um, functional programming, as I said on the very first day, is exactly what I said. Okay? It's a mindset. It's a habit. It's a style. It's a paradigm. It's just a matter of how you use it. Everything you do from here on out, every course you take, you can think functionally. It doesn't, need, doesn't mean you need to do 15451 in SML, like I did, OK? But it can just mean that you think a little bit more about safety. You think a little bit more about specification. You think a little bit more in general before you start coding, OK? That's also a really important detail. Safety, simplicity, expressivity. I think that these are very important ideas that we've been using this semester. I promise you that functional programming is a way of improving our ability to program. And I see that, and I believe that wholeheartedly. I hope that in some way you see it too. Because programming is, is just a linguistic phenomenon. It's just communication. It's me standing on, on the side of the room here and going, hey, Alice, can you give me x cons x's? And then Alice you know, goes ahead and gives me a list. right? But functional programming is just about how we can make that communication better. I'm going to borrow another thing here from Michael Erdman when I say um, something you can get across, and I hope that you see now um, from, from this class, is the fact that Code can be art. Code is art. Code can be beautiful. Code can be expressive. Code can be beautiful. 
And code can be something that explains an idea better than you could in your own words sometimes. And code can change how you think. And I hope this class has changed how you thought. So this is the first, and I'm not done by the way. Um, this is the first chapter of the rest of your life, as I promised you. But knowing what you know, you can't go back. And that was what I set out to do on the very first day. I set to, uh, as Robert Harper likes to say, uh, I set out to ruin you, to ruin you forever. And now the door is closed. It's a one-way door. You can never go back, because you are forever a functional programmer. I'm still not done. <laughs> There's a reason why I have 20 minutes here, OK? OK, so um, this class has been a labor of love on my part for the past six months of my life. And uh, actually, before that, the past four years of my life. Okay? Uh, and I, it wouldn't feel right to do something without saying goodbye in some form. But uh, one thing I need to do, I have this little rule. Okay? Every time I make a joke that I didn't think of, I have to cite it. All right? I'm not allowed to make jokes that I did not think of myself because it would be unfair to make people think I'm funnier than I am. Well, uh, you know. So uh, basically, this idea comes into play again when I say that uh, there are many people I have to acknowledge. Uh, teaching's not just one guy up here doing everything, okay? as much as I liked to phrase it that way to you on the first day. It's the combined efforts of everyone that I've worked with, my staff, and the people that I've been taught by and taught with for literally years. So a lot of people have shown their faces in this class without showing their faces. Like, you don't know their names, but they were here. Okay? Uh, and the list is very, very long, but I'm going to try. By, by Jove. Uh, so I teed this class for many years. I, I teed this class for four years uh, since I was a sophomore, basically. Um, well, three years, three and a half. Uh, and through years of 150, I've met people that I consider my friends, I consider my mentors, and I consider people that I will know for the rest of my life. Okay? Um, but they influence me every single time that I teach. And so the list of people is everyone I've ever TA'd with. Because some way, small or large, they have showed up in this course in some way. And the list is long, but the impact that they've had on everything that you've seen this semester has not been small. And some people I, I could shout out a bit more particularly than others, uh, but those people know who they are. Okay? Um, but this is a list of, of all the times that we've had. Um, and honestly, I wanted to also give it up to my TAs for caring and for always having your interests at heart. They do so much work, and you don't know it behind the scenes. Okay? You have no idea the amount of work. So please, for your TAs, who are seated on the sides here. They're on the ground manning the infantry units. I'm up here in like, the sky sipping a cup of tea and going, huh, that's quaint. Anyways. <laughs> I was also on the trenches once, OK? I get to be up here now. Um, OK. Um, and also, I allege this, but the people that I've met over the course of this class, uh, some of which I left behind so I could come here for three months. Um, also, my friends who supported and kept me sane uh, throughout this summer, uh, who I really um, I'm thankful for. Um, Dilson Kanar, our lovely faculty mentor, who has advised me on many a thing this semester. Um, and Sam Grip, because they were not just only cool with me coming to come here to teach and like basically take off from work, but they were like, hey, will you like some gold coins? And I was like, yeah. So um, uh, the, the shirts are not here yet, by the way. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll have them by the final exam. Actually, let's see. FedEx. Nope. All right. Uh, it would have been here, but they were late. And then finally, some acknowledgments to specific people. Um, Mike Erdman, who I don't know if any of you have met, but uh, I think that he's inspired me with even a modicum of his compassion would be too much. One of the most compassionate people I've ever met. So every time that I do something that's student-facing, I think of him. Uh, Bob Harper, who showed me that it's OK and it's powerful to have passion and that it's, it's the right thing to do in the classroom. Uh, Jacob Newman, without which these slides would literally not exist. Like this slide setup I'm using right now, I got from a previous instructor of 150 called Jacob Newman. So without him, this would not be as pretty as it is. Uh, Anil Ada, who teaches 15251, uh, I, I cribbed the idea for alternate grading schemes and giving little boxes for people to draw stuff on from exams from him. Uh, Ryan O'Donnell, who showed me how to start off a lecture with style, because somebody could just like come in and it was like 8 a.m. He just showered and he'd be playing music and be bopping. I'd be like, yeah, ready to learn quantum computation. Um, Maura Harkle Balter, uh, who taught me how uh, nice it is to hand out candy during lectures. Uh, Maura, I might have gone a little overboard here. Um, Suhas Kata, uh, who showed me the power of high chew specifically. It's not my, it's not my idea. The high chews are all him. I just adopted it. 
uh, Brian Railing, who showed me how important it is to have in-class exercises. Because you can't, just, you can't just learn by sitting there, all right? And Pat Virtue, who showed me that it's possible to consider the individual when it comes to teaching. It's possible to still think about the, each individual person, each individual student. Uh, and these are just a few people that I wanted to. And I've been thinking about this for, for many months, OK? Uh, but this is kind of uh, one way that I have of shouting out some of those people that mattered a lot to me over the course of this course. All right. Oh, no. Yes, no. All right. I hate goodbyes. Um, I've never liked goodbyes. At my company offsite in like February, like um, uh, we were all saying goodbye at like the buses, and I was like, I'm gonna go stand over here in the trees where nobody can see me. Um, but now I have all of your attention. Fuck! What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? I have all of your attention, and I hate goodbyes. Well, all right. I was never very good at saying goodbye. Okay, I was very good at standing in the trees. Um, but I was I was at Lola actually for the past like four days. Um, uh, and I was while. I, <laughs> I've been wearing it the whole day. Is this surprising? I don't know. <laughs> nah, it was my first music fest. It was a fun time. But anyways, while I was there, like bopping along to Alan Walker, I was going like, eh, you know, I was thinking like, okay, what am I going to say in my final lecture? <laughs> <laughs> you know, while I was moshing with people, I was thinking like, what am I, what am I going to do? So, <laughs> and I thought for days, for days, for like weeks, I've been thinking about this, and I didn't have the right words. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to describe what I was feeling. And, and how do you know what to say? How do you know what to say? So, OK. Um, and here's the way I cope, right? See, the problem is I premeditate my slides. I premeditate what I say. I premeditate the jokes I make. But how do you premeditate something that's so important? So you know what? I'm done premeditating. I'm just going to say what I think. And I'm not going to follow a script. I, for once, I'm just going to let myself say something off the cuff without, to be honest with you, actually honest. No tricks. No jokes. And, and you know what? Because my goodbye should be genuine and, and unplanned. And what do you? Yo. Fuck! <laughs> I tried. I really tried. I tried to be genuine. I tried to be genuine, but the words, they just kept coming. What do I do? Well, you know what? You know what? OK. It's fine. I can do this anyways. Jokes aside, my lectures, I think, take the form of stories. That's the way I see it. Every time I come up here to you every Tuesday and Thursday to say, tell something to you, to me, it's a story. It's a well-defined story with the, with the beginning and an end and a climax and a, and a villain. And I, I see that when I, when I tell you stories. But the question is, what is the story of this lecture? What am I saying? Because I kind of just reviewed a bunch of stuff and talked about the course for a bit. What is the story, though? And I was trying to figure this out. Um, but what I found out was actually like this, this, like this, this tension, this thing I couldn't figure out, was because the story was something I, I hadn't quite wanted to admit, maybe. So what's the story of this lecture? Well, this whole semester has been about you. This story is about me. Okay? So the story begins with my graduation, actually. Uh, I don't know if I've, I've mentioned this in lecture to you, but I'm, uh, I had COVID when I graduated. So I didn't go to graduation. Everyone else walked on stage. And I, I, I sat there in my pajamas, and I was like, yep, looks fun, um, while Billy Porter talked uh, last year. And then I was like, OK, uh, cool, that happened. But what I found was that like, you know, graduating with COVID, well, first of all, I sent my best friend with like, a cardboard cutout of me like, on stage. So that was, it was a good joke. Like, I'm glad that that happened. But what happened was basically I stayed in my, in my house for a week. OK, and I got out of my house, and then the road was paved, and I was like, they towed my car. And I did tow my car. And then immediately after having COVID, I had to go get my car from the dump. Okay, um, And then my parents came to pick me up and pack up and leave Pittsburgh, like, a few days later. So I didn't get, like, a closure. Like, I, I didn't get to actually, like, say goodbye to CMU or to Pittsburgh. I kind of just, like, left and then came back, like, a few months later. So part of the reason why it was so hard for me to write this lecture was, Part of this lecture is not just me saying goodbye to you all. Part of this lecture is me saying goodbye to CMU, to 150, which I've given four years of my life to, something I care about immensely. Because I didn't get that goodbye. I didn't really get to say it. This is my last lecture. I am not a professor. I am not a professor. I am a, I am a, uh, 
software engineer, as dirty as the word is. I'm lucky to have given, been given a three month lease on life to come back here and enjoy what I missed. But uh, this will be my last lecture. So this story ends with me. It ends with me saying goodbye to 150 and seeing me. But, but here's a question also. Why do you care? Why am I saying this? What is, what's going on here? Well, how did I get here? OK, well, before I actually answer that question, actually, I talk about how I got here. Um, is anyone's parents here a professor? OK, actually, that would be a significantly more minority crowd than I thought. Uh, my dad's a professor, and his dad was a professor. So when I was 18 and I didn't have much to do, Number one was, I want to go to med school. And number two was, I want to be a professor. And for years, I carried that with me. I was like, oh yeah, I want to be a professor. You know, look at me with my, with my you know, shirt and my tucked in sweater. And I actually dressed like that for a period during freshman year. Uh, <laughs> that's not a joke. Um, and I wanted to be a professor. But when I was, it was my senior year, and I said, um, and my dream was to teach, basically. And I got to when I became a TA for 150. But my senior year, I decided not to go for a PhD. Because uh, I realized that wasn't for me. It was like, I didn't enjoy doing research. I didn't enjoy um, just like doing things that didn't have as much impact as I thought. Okay? Not to say you can't have impact in academia, but it's a rough life for sure. You know, it's like, it wasn't for me. Okay? It's respectable for sure. But, but I said goodbye to 150. And I was cool with that because you know, it was a good four years. But I didn't think I'd ever teach again because I'm not ever going to get a PhD. But then I emailed Tom Cortina and then I asked him if I could teach. And he was like, Cool. And I was like, cool. I'm also moderately freaking out, but cool. So now I have this opportunity again. But this is my lease on life, right? This is my second chance. So now's my time to make peace with it again because not a whole lot of people get this opportunity. Don't have a PhD, barely have a bachelor's, and they get to come here and teach their favorite topic at their favorite place in the world. Okay? Uh, so another thing that makes it hard is how do you say goodbye to that? How do you, what do I say to kind of like sunset this thing that I've been looking forward to for like, like four years of my life, basically. You know, I made a LinkedIn post before I came here shortly, which was like, anyone who knows me knows that I've wanted this for as long as I've known about 150, basically. So how do you say goodbye to that? What's the theme of this lecture? What the hell am I doing up here? What's the theme of this lecture? Well, I usually like, I don't know if you've seen this, but like my lectures, I usually uh, give a little like phrase or quote with them. Um, to kind of summarize the contents. And I was thinking, what's the quote for this lecture? What's the theme? And I kept thinking, and I, I kept thinking, and I, it was so difficult, but this one phrase came to mind, and I couldn't get it out of my brain. And that phrase was, something worth learning. If I had to pick a phrase, something worth learning. Something worth learning. Lots of things are worth learning, right? It's worth learning to play the piano. It's worth learning to do your taxes. Um, uh, it's worth learning to. It's worth learning to learn how to function program. But the more I thought about this, like it sounds good, it sounds right, like I want it to be the thing, but it wasn't right because I was thinking like something worth learning. Something worth learning is not what gets me out of my bed every day. I don't get out of my bed because, because Excel spreadsheets are worth learning, because doing my taxes is worth learning, because playing the piano is something worth learning, because that doesn't, isn't something I'm going to do now. Something worth learning is something for the future. It's something for later. Something worth learning, like, and this was a real conflict in me. Like, like what am I doing here? Like, why, am I, why did I leave behind like, my friends, my life for three months? Why did I give up my job that I very much enjoy? Why, did I, why, did I, why am I paying rent in Palo Alto and Pittsburgh? Why did I come here? What is, what is the reason by which I am here? It's not something worth learning. Because something worth learning doesn't do it enough justice. It's something different that's driving me. It's not because it's worth learning, because there's a million and one things worth learning. But never does that make me want to do it. So I don't think this, this I tried this on precise, but I don't think it fits. All right? Let's try it again. I think the theme of this lecture, the way to make it make sense to me, and the way to make it make sense to everyone who comes after me, this class and this time I've had here has been something worth teaching. OK? Um, the story is inconsistent. So, yeah. An idea worth spreading. You know, TED Talks? Ideas worth spreading. 
But what does it mean for something to be something worth teaching? I've heard stories from you. You've gone and like, told your friends, like, oh, yeah, this functional programming stuff. Oh, it's so cool. Um, and that, that, makes me feel, that makes me feel good when you say that. But like, something worth teaching, like, I don't expect any of you to become teachers. Okay? Many, many of you have dreams and aspirations and things you'd like to do that are not teaching functional programming. And that's OK. All right? So what do I mean when I say something worth teaching, which is a very personal goal to me, but it doesn't really apply to you? Well, for me, this is obvious. This is my life. But what does something worth teaching mean to you? Here's what I want you to consider. What do you want to get out of this course? Why are you here? Why are you here standing in your chairs right now? So I'm here to teach you functional programming, ostensibly, and you're here to learn functional programming. But that's, that's boring. That's not the end of the story. So close your eyes. Close your eyes and put your head down. Everyone. Functional programming is a proxy for success. It's not why you're here. OK? <laughs> it's a proxy as in it hopefully will correlate to success for you. But nobody's dream out of the gate is to get an A in functional programming. So close your eyes. And I want you to think, why are you here? Why are you taking 15150? Why are you at CMU? Why are you taking this course? What is the thing that drives you, gets you out of bed, and gets you moving? This is my social experiment. And by the way, whatever you're thinking of, it cannot be anything related to grades or your degree. Okay? Nobody is, comes out of the womb wanting, like, dreaming of getting an A in, in a class. Okay? That's a proxy for something else. Think about what something else is. Do you have it? Thumbs up when you've got it. OK, and just to make sure you've got it, uh, I want you to whisper it very, very quietly so only you can hear it to yourself under your breath. Like now. OK. All right, you're going to open your eyes now. Don't lose sight of that goal, basically, is what I'm trying to say. It's OK to have your own. That, the point I'm trying to say is that is your something worth teaching. For me, something worth teaching, something worth doing, something that gets me out of my bed is this, is you. Your something worth teaching, your thing that gets you going, is probably something different. And that's OK. But whatever it is, I hope that this course and the things you've learned have helped you on that stepping stone to getting to where you need to be. Because that's all that matters at the end of the day, right? Like fun I realize functional programming is not the most important thing in the world to all of you. And that's OK. It's not exactly the most important thing in the world to me. It's close. But I'm, uh, it's not quite there. But I hope that it gets you where you need to be. Okay? That's what something worth teaching means for me to you. Okay? So don't be afraid to make an impact, as I said in the last lecture. Don't be afraid to give 110%. Because what I have observed is that out in the real world, okay, passion makes all the difference. I go out there and people are like, oh, you're, so, you're full of so much excitement and energy. And I'm like, I'm literally just existing, man. What do you want from me? Like, cool, I'm glad you like it. But like, you know, I'm just vibing, all right? The passion makes the journey worth it. So the proof is in the passion. Um, and it might feel disingenuous for me to come up and be like, yeah, you can achieve your childhood dreams. You can really do it. Um, uh, uh, sorry, that was, that was not a dig at Randy Fash. Um, uh, bless his soul. I, I, he actually inspired me quite a bit. Um, it might feel disingenuous, but some of you in this room, quite a few of you in this room, are smarter than me. Don't mistake just because I'm the one at the front of the room that I'm, I'm smarter. I just happen to know more. Okay? My 11th grade teacher said this to me and left quite an impact on me. I just know more than you. But even that's fading. So what I do feel qualified to speak on, though, is that I can come up here and talk. I was never the smartest person in my, in my grade, right? I never the TA that got everything immediately. But I have a passion, and I can talk, OK? A little too much, all right? So if you can get up there and just go for what you want, that's what's going to matter way more than, than if you got an A in a class, or if you got a B in a class, or if you, if you are the smartest person in the room by some metric. It's such a shallow metric, really. So let's recap. Something worth teaching. This idea means three things. One, it's my journey. It's how I make this story make sense. Make sense to myself that I ended up here. Why did I come here? Why did I give up my life to come here? What am I doing here? Why did I, why did I leave behind everything that I, I love so I could be here for three months? Something worth teaching is how I explain that to myself. And it makes the story make sense. Number two is for you. It means finding something worth teaching. Your something worth teaching. Your mission. Your, your dreams, what gets you out of bed. And go all in. Go all in. Because if, I, if I'm, I'm unqualified to speak on very, very many things. But it's worked out pretty well for me so far. And then something worth teaching. Thirdly, that's you as a class. Because you have been something worth teaching. I'm just about to finish up here. No more selling. Uh, this is the end. Um, and this is goodbye to my time as an instructor. Goodbye to CMU and goodbye to 150. Uh, I'm going to take off the jacket because 
I'm very glad. Can I have it? I'm very glad oh, to have had this opportunity. But now we're the same. Alumni of 150, all right? Just alumni in different ways, OK? Um, I'm probably never going to teach again, but that's OK. Because I, I was given a lease on life to do this. Because this is the most important thing I could have done in this instance. And I, as much as I like to complain about your emails, about dealing with everything, it was worth it. Because this idea is worth teaching. And you have been something worth teaching, OK? So um, I hate goodbyes. I hate goodbyes. I could never good at saying goodbye, so let's, let's shout it. Let's shout goodbye, because I can't express myself in any way other than anger, OK? <laughs> let's shout it. Something worth teaching. That's what this has been, OK? My time is coming to an end, and that's OK. On the first lecture, I said something. I'm going to say it one final time for you, one last time. I love functional programming. And you don't have to say it, because I realize on the first lecture, I told you that it didn't matter. I realize now nothing could have mattered more. Because me loving functional programming, being willing to come up here and upheave my life, being willing to be here right now, me loving functional programming, that means that this was something worth loving, that this was something worth teaching. So I hope to you that this has been something worth learning and something worth teaching. Thank you so much. Thank you. You still have a final exam. <laughs> but thank you for coming. That's the end. Um, uh, please take some high shoes if you would like. And uh, please stay in touch. Yo, LinkedIn? Yo, Frank.